Welcome to the National Humanities Center and to this international conference, Beyond Despair, Theory and Practice in Environmental Humanities. I'm Robert Newman, the President and Director of the Center. I would first like to thank our sponsors for this conference. Our presenting sponsor is RTI International. Also, we have sponsorship from the Burroughs Welcome Fund, from Tukasi, the North Carolina Humanities Council, Sally and Russell Robinson, and Duke University Press. Thank you very much to our sponsors. The National Humanities Center long has had an active interest in environmental concerns, dating to its inception year, 1978-79, when it held a fellow seminar on man and nature with a position paper written by then fellow and current trustee from MIT, Harriet Rithville. During the 1980s, there was another seminar on energy and the values of American society. And all along, for our 41 years, there have been fellows working on environmental topics. And this year, we have six fellows specifically working on such topics. Funding from the Donnelly Foundation annually supports a fellow working on environmental concerns, one of whom, Jared Farmer, produced a book, Trees in Paradise, which won the Billington Prize from the Organization of American Historians. Former fellows also constitute eight of the 20 presidents from the American Society for Environmental History. But we feel this is far from a well-worn topic. Indeed, we consider the consequences of climate change to be the most dire threat facing our planet and the most compelling case for a comprehensive rethinking of who we are and how we live. Issues for which the humanities offer the most cogent and relevant content, contexts, and methodologies. We've organized this conference with the recognition that, as Freud once told us, theory is good, but it doesn't keep things from happening. We wish to formulate bold ideas while also considering the nuanced and practical ways in which they may be applied. The title of our conference, Beyond Despair, does not seek to evade the troublesome future we're facing. We understand that we have entered a terrific cascade with an attendant unraveling of our ecosystem's fabric. One might invoke Mahatma Gandhi's prophetic words in 1928, God forbid that India should ever take to industrialism after the manner of the West. If an entire nation of what was then in 1928 300 million took to similar economic exploitation, Gandhi said, it would strip the world bare like locusts. Rather, we organized this conference with a clear view of the threat of climate change as an existential crisis, a crossroads of conviction about how we define our personal and collective identities, not in isolation, but in recognition of the intricate web of relationships that sustain the earth we inhabit. We see the present, imminent, and long-term exacerbating catastrophes that have, are, and will be caused by climate change as requiring a revolutionary moment in promoting the centrality of the public good, broadly conceived in our collective thinking, promoting a basic right to an inhabitable environment. We also see this moment as requiring radical shifts in our pedagogical and research approaches by integrating science and policy with humanities lenses that provide focus and context in terms of place, ethics, storytelling, and culture, which may ultimately offer the means for countering human-caused impending disasters with integrated and legacy solutions. We also wish to promote an understanding that ecological and social concerns are in concert rather than in opposition. As Pope Francis states in his remarkable encyclical, Laudato Si, a true ecological approach always becomes a social approach. It must integrate questions of justice in debates on the environment so as to hear both the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor. Our intent, therefore, is to go beyond despair, the imagination, 
thought, and action. So our mission here over the next two and a half days is audacious, but significant. We are live streaming all panels and urge you to use your social media platforms to encourage all of your contacts to tune in so our impact is amplified enormously. Again, hashtag beyond despair. And it's now my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, whose passion and wisdom I am confident will set the tone for the next couple of days. Shabankar Banerjee was born and grew up in a small town in West Bengal, India, before heading to Kolkata to study electrical engineering. After earning his undergraduate degree, he came to the United States where he pursued graduate studies in physics and computer science at New Mexico University. However, Shabankar had loved the arts since he was a child, so alongside his scientific and technical studies, he also tried to sprinkle in classes in painting and photography. After graduate school, Shabankar worked for six years at the Los Alamos National Laboratory in New Mexico and at Boeing in Seattle. And while he worked at those jobs, he started taking nature photographs of desert vistas all across the Southwest on trips sponsored by his local chapter of the Sierra Club. When he arrived in Seattle, he took up mountaineering. And at that point, he started thinking about combining his passion for art and his concerns about what he saw around him. Lands and wildlife in distress, indigenous cultures disappearing. In 2000, Shabankar left his job at Boeing to become a full-time artist, educator, and activist. In the years since, Shabankar has established himself as one of the foremost chroniclers of what is happening to our planet, raising awareness about indigenous human rights, the plight of animal species and their habitats, and the impact of climate change. In 2001, he began two years of groundbreaking field photography in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, and the photos he took were published in his first book, Seasons of Life and Land, which drew international media attention when an exhibition of those images at the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History was censored by the Bush administration after Barbara Boxer used them on the Senate floor to temporarily block drilling in Anwar. As a result of the attention from that controversy, that exhibit traveled to 16 other museums around the United States. And the year, in the years since, Shabankar's work has been exhibited in more than 50 museums around the world and has been discussed in several path-breaking art history books and in prominent journals, magazines, and newspapers. Shabankar's work engages three geographic regions, Arctic North America and Siberia, the desert of northern New Mexico, and the coastal temperate rainforest of the, of the Pacific. As the editor of the critically acclaimed anthology, Arctic Voices, Resistance at the Tipping Point, and author and editor of many books and essays, his voice has echoed among students, activists, environmental thinkers with consistency, clarity, and overwhelming evidence. His writing on art and environmental humanities and his many media interviews have contributed to his acclaim as an enlightened and passionate advocate for conservation. Shabankar has given lectures at universities across the world and to the, de to, to the delegates at the United Nations. He has held academic appointments at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, Fordham University, the University of Utah, and Dartmouth College, among others. He is currently the Lannan Foundation Endowed Chair and Professor of Art and Ecology at the University of New Mexico, where he heads the Land Arts of the American West program. Shabankar's photography, writing, and activism have contributed to defeating and or slowing down oil and gas development in some of the most bioculturally significant places in Arctic North America. And he has been justly recognized for his achievements. He's received a Cultural Freedom Foundation Award from the Lannan Foundation, a Greenleaf Artist Award from the UN Environmental Program, National Conservation Awards from the National Wildlife Federation and the Sierra Club, and the Hausberg Award from the Alaska Conservation Foundation. He was named an Arctic Hero, which is a great designation, 
an Arctic hero from the Alaska Wilderness League, and a distinguished alumnus by New Mexico State University. This evening, he joins us to discuss the intersection of the two biggest natural crises of our time, biological annihilation and climate breakdown, and how public scholarship in the humanities can meaningfully engage these issues. Shibankar, Vicki, and I are so pleased to see you again. Our friendship stretches now some 15 years, during which time we've marveled at the beauty of your art and the unwavering passion and diligence you bring to the most important issue of our time. It's a delight to welcome you for the first time to the National Humanities Center. Please join me in welcoming Shibankar Banerjee. Thank you, Robert. That was the most expansive and generous introduction anyone has given. Uh, and also for your expansive introduction about what the conference the next few days will be about. Uh, I also want to take a moment to thank uh, my friend Heidi Camp, who has helped putting this event together, and all of the staff members who, are, who have helped organizing this event, and my dear friend, Dr. Vicki Newman, and also want to acknowledge a dear friend, Dr. Joni Adamson, who is with you here. I want to take a, and I want to really acknowledge the work of all of the artists whose work you see on the walls of the center here as part of the Beyond Despair exhibition. I had a opportunity to see that uh, this evening, this afternoon. I want to begin with acknowledging the uh, first peoples, the indigenous peoples on whose traditional homeland we are standing, sitting, talking, gathering over the next few days. In 2017, the state of North Carolina uh, replaced the Columbus Day with Indigenous Peoples Day. In the official proclamation, Governor Ray Cooper acknowledged eight indigenous tribes. I will not be able to pronounce it appropriately or correctly, but nevertheless, it is necessary to mention all eight names. Kohari, Eastern Band of Cherokee, Haliwa Saponi, Lumbi, Meherin, Okanechi Band of Saponi, Saponi, and Wakama Siwan. Uh, I want to begin with a uh, small uh, 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 small note, a biographical note, so that you see where I'm coming from. As Robert mentioned, I am not uh, giving this presentation, and also it's really an honor, and I'm humbled to be uh, with you all this evening. Uh, I... Uh, I come from a slightly different background, as Robert mentioned, so I'm not speaking to you as an expert on environmental humanities, but someone who is, at best, a dedicated, curious amateur, as Johnny Adamson might call, citizen environmental humanist. Um, that said, uh, today I, I, uh, I'm a tenured full professor at my university in the Department of Art in a program called Art and Ecology and hold two additional uh, affiliate appointments in two other departments. But the reason I mention that is I have no academic training in any of those three disciplines. I'm fully self-taught in everything I do, mostly today. Uh, but this uh, lack of disciplinary training has afforded me with a kind of license to roam, or rather to build bridges. So the talk is about going to be about that. So this long, very uninspiring uh, title of my presentation, I want to just spend uh, just a little bit of time uh, mentioning a few notes on what are those uh, phrases. So building bridges is essentially, I think of it as social action. It's bringing people together, whether with different cultures, different disciplines, different ideologies even. So it's really social action. Connecting the dots, on the other hand, is an intellectual or analytical work. So I'll explain both as we go through it. 
The word apprehending, or the term apprehending, I'm borrowing from literary studies scholar Rob Nixon in his path-breaking book, uh, Slow Violence and the Environmentalism of the Poor, Rob writes that apprehension is a crossover term, meaning a bridge building term, a crossover term that encapsulates domains of perception, emotion, and action. Meaning, we need to be aware, we need to feel, and we need to act. It's a very apt phrase for what I'm about to talk about. Multi-species futures is almost self-explanatory, so and that's what the talk is about. Before I talk about beyond despair, I was just at the other Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton the last couple of days, and over dinner someone mentioned, like I was asking, what is beyond despair? And someone mentioned it's action. And this evening, uh, Robert also mentioned it's also imagination. But before we get to beyond, let me just dwell in a moment with despair. Uh, in uh, the age of the, and this evening, I usually prepare notes for a talk, but this evening, because of the subject matter, I decided to speak from the heart. So I don't have notes. I have lots of sort of printed pages from which I may read a thing or two, but mostly I'm speaking from the heart. So in, uh, in the age of the sea, the third book that Rachel Carson wrote, there is a passage in which she is writing. Some, an experience. So Carson is looking into uh, what she called a cave and sees a uh, starfish or a sea star hanging from the rock, one of its two feet touching the water. There is no wind, and the scene created a perfect reflection. Carson's narrative is beautiful, celebratory, jubilant. That book was published in 1955. The first three books she wrote, she only wrote four books. The first three were all on the sea, Carson's True Love, uh, while Silent Spring, the famous one, tragically has wiped out that legacy for the most part from public imagination. The Age of the Sea was published in 1955. 60 years later, it's exactly 60 years later, I was looking into an almost identical scene, except in my case, it was despair and tragedy. So that's the cover slide. You see a starfish or a sea star. And in my case, it was in the Olympic National Park at the edge of the sea in Washington State in the Pacific Northwest. So I'm looking in, and the starfish is struggling to hang on to the rock and falling off in the act of dying. So I'm making this image in the act of dying. So unlike Carson, who was observing as a person looking in, for me, I had to insert myself into the frame. So here you don't see it very clearly, but my ghostly, part of my ghostly image is that. So the reflection is of mine, not of the starfish, because I am the perpetrator and potentially a protector as well. Between 2013 and 2017, more than 20 different species of starfish perished between Mexico and Alaska, all along the Pacific coast. What scientists later called in 2017 the, an unprecedented in geographic scale. And in an article in the New Yorker, the writer called it the greatest wildlife mass mortality event of our time. I was living there at the time. So over the past two decades, I have engaged with three geographies, Alaska's Arctic, Pacific Northwest, right here, and where I live now, in New Mexico. And in all three geographies, I have witnessed extreme impacts of climate breakdown and extreme impacts of biological annihilation. So the two really come together in my work in through different frames. But now, as Robert mentioned, that I teach in the Art and Ecology program, so I want to spend a bit of time. Today, I'm not going to talk about my own creative work, I'm going to talk mainly from the vantage point of a teacher, of a community organizer, of an activist, and a, and a public scholar. So I teach a class called Integrative Ecology and Social Transformation, and we begin in the 19th century. Broadly, it is understood, or widely it is understood, that ecology, the field that we call ecology, 
was largely developed by scientists in the 19th century. The term was coined by Ernest Haeckel in 1866. But there is a parallel development happening at the same time as art historian Greg Thomas, in his eye-opening and extraordinary book, points out that artists had developed just as complex ideas of ecology completely independently and without any influence from science. These artists were Barbizon School of Painters. It's an extraordinary book. But the book does something even more. It is hardly known. It's not taught in most schools where art history is being taught, unfortunately. But he points out something more, much more significant, much more fundamental, the dawn of conservation. It is also widely known that the land conservation started, so the protection of natural places, modern conservation started in the United States with the founding of the Yellowstone National Park. Thomas points out this is false. There is 20 years prior to that, the forest of Fontainebleau he places as the first protected natural preserve in the world. Historians can then argue and find maybe other examples of that, but according to Thomas, that's where he places it. Furthermore, John Muir, who is lionized as, a, as the sort of the founder of the modern conservation movement, meaning someone explicitly agitated politically to advance conservation, Thomas points out that is not true either. It was Theodore Rousseau, because he explicitly and his action. He took explicit political action to get this place protected. And his cohorts of the Barbizon School. But more importantly for me, what struck about that episode is something else, moral ecology. So in the United States, land conservation started with erasing indigenous habitation and criminalizing indigenous practices and for survival. Here, something else was taking place. These artists developed a different vision, a vision of moral ecology. Even though this particular work is not included in the book, but it is one of my favorite drawings of all time, is by Jean-Francois Mier, whose work many of you know through his more famous painting called The Gliners. This is called uh, Faggot Gatherers Returning from the Forest at the Museum of Fine Arts, Boston, in their permanent collection. As you recede into the space, you see the forest peoples and the forest are becoming one. In another way to read this photograph, read this drawing, is that you cannot separate forest from forest peoples. This is the beginning of modern moral ecology. And it was entirely developed by a group of artists with Theodore Rousseau and Jean-Francois Mier at the helm of that movement. Why am I bringing all this up, 19th century history? Because this is very relevant today. On February 13th, on ur urging from a small group of wildlife conservation NGOs, the Supreme Court of India ruled to evict numbers vary, potentially anywhere between five to eight million forest-dwelling indigenous peoples. Critics are calling it the largest mass eviction in the name of conservation. So it's a very, very tragic story unfolding before us. And if it moves forward, up to 8 million people could be evicted from their land. Very immediately, as unsurprisingly, a more than 300 conservationists uh, wrote a letter, open letter, saying that we do not regard this order as pro-conservation. On the contrary, it is a real setback for conservation in India. And they argue that India's forest cannot be imagined without its forest people. Uh, so this, this, this issue is unfolding as we speak. But, uh, but what, are, what is the problem? So some of the critiques are pointing out uh, various reasons why this may be taking place. No one really knows exactly. But some of the critiques are saying it's to advance tourism. It's to advance resource extraction. It's to advance land grab so that monocrop plantation could be advanced. But there is a fourth element, which is all over the world, since the last UN climate report came out, is forest covers are becoming extraordinarily important for climate mitigation. 
Sarachandra Lele is a very renowned uh, Indian ecologist uh, based in uh, Bangalore, wrote a uh, short op-ed, one-page op-ed, even two weeks before this ruling, in which he points out this idea of forest carbon. The, uh, this is Lele's words. The government prefers to mix categories and fudge estimates because it hopes to quote unquote sell this quote unquote forest carbon to offset the emissions of rich countries. He continues on to say a carbon centric policy will hurt the indigenous communities, the tribal communities, the poor communities who are dependent on this forest, as well as the biodiversity. Last month in March, two weeks ago, about two weeks ago, the United Nations Development Program published a small piece in which they talk about that uh, there are more than 370 million indigenous peoples in 90 countries and they maintain forests that are home to 80% of terrestrial biodiversity. A growing body of research shows that forests are best protected when they are managed by communities who depend on them. So moving forward, uh, this all brings us back to those of us who also are interested in history to a moment, 1977. The great, late, great Indian novelist and India's most significant uh, defender of indigenous rights, tribal rights, Mahasheta Devi, who continues to remain as my most significant inspiration in my life, wrote a book called Oronir Odhikar. Many of her work has been already, have been already translated into English, but not this one. Uh, it roughly translates to, Oronir Odhikar translates to rights of forest, because there is so much talk about rights of nature, various phases of its invocation, and contemporary implementation, this book predates some of this, and particularly in defense of tribal rights. Uh, so, but, so uh, anyway, so this book was published in 1977 and won the highest literary award given in India called Shahitya Academy uh, in 1979. The book is grounded in rebellion, Ulgulan, led by tribal leaders Birsa Munda. And in a thesis, one scholar writes, time and again, the tribals of India have protested against the exploitative system. The continuing influx of outsiders to the geocultural spheres of the tribals has led to the destabilization of their indigenous social order, affecting their very survival, both in physical and cultural terms. This process has had far-reaching impact on the tribal society, and their discontent surfaced in the form of numerous uprisings and movements. All these issues figure in Mahasheta's Oronir Odhikar. Right now, I am writing a very short piece which is being uh, put together by a dear friend, uh, Carl Cusero, at the Princeton University Art Museum. And I'm just going to write about the cover. Uh, I'm not going to go read uh, necessarily uh, Mahasheta's textual work, but the cover, I think, is extraordinary. And as Joni Adamson and others would tell you, multi-species studies, in which Joni is a very eminent scholar, uh, is very active field right now, and has been over the last decade or so. And there are many branches of multi-species studies coming from multi-species ethnography, multi-species literary studies, in philosophy, and many other fields. In that, if we look at that, it's quite obvious that you can't remove, you can't separate the forest from the forest peoples. The people is made up of the forest and vice versa. But there is something a little bit more because even the culture embodied in, this is the, presumably the image of Bisa Munda, is you see culture, people are dancing. But there is a little bit more that is the contemporary multi-species studies has not yet engaged with, which is rebellion. So this is an extraordinary image that brings the idea of rebellion also. Uh, with that, I will now move on to, so what I'm doing is I'm going to walk with you three very quick examples of where artists acted as bridge builders. So in the case of the Barbizon artist, Jean Francois and his uh, colleagues were acting as the bridge builder between the forest and the forest peoples. All of their work, people were always present. Here, the artist's name is Khaled Choudhury. 
whose name I'm sure you have not heard about, one of the most influential and eminent theater stage directors, uh, who was also an artist, who made that drawing. With that, the second case study is uh, Robert mentioned Gandhi's famous quote. Is an extraordinary episode in the war history of art, but not really known that widely either. Is in two 2014, I'm just telling you stories, and hopefully, and to stop me whenever you need to stop when the time runs out, but in 2014, I got probably the most unusual invitation of my life to write an essay, to write the art chapter in what became the book, Rutledge Handbook of Religion and Ecology. The invitation came from Dr. Mary Evelyn Tucker at Yale, and that book was edited by uh, Mary Evelyn, her husband, Dr. John Grimm, both at Yale, and Willis Jenkins at University of Virginia. And I told Mary Evelyn, this is, this is ridiculous. I know nothing about religion and ecology, and you're asking me to add yet another layer of art on top of that. I am the last person who can write this piece, so I declined. And I said, you are at Yale. You can get any number of uh, art historians to write on this subject. But Mary Evelyn did not take no for an answer. She said, nope, you are the one who is to write this. So it became an extraordinarily difficult task for me, but gave me a chance to think about India in a new way that I had not thought about. In 1938, there was a, so India's liberation movement, again, moment of despair. Those of you who know the history, Jallian Wallabagh, the massacre by, uh, after the order of a British general led to more than 1,000 people massacred, uh, peaceful people who were gathering which led Rabindranath Tagore to renounce his knighthood. So there are two figures. There are hundreds of figures in that national liberation movement. But the two figures that are quite significant are one is Gandhi, which Rob Robert spoke about, and the other is Tagore. They had these two men, they were both born in the same year. They admire each other's work very much but they were what you would call adversaries in terms of their ideological position of how India ought to be liberated. Gandhi's position was that through economic and political independence, by economic he meant rural uh, revitalization of rural economy, strengthening of rural economy, putting labor back into the economy and on and on, artisanal production and so on, is how we would liberate India. Tagore had a very different notion he thought, and his plan was through cultural regeneration, we would liberate India. And these two, and they both went ahead and did extraordinary work. And in the middle of this is this artist named Nandalal Bosch, who is now regarded as father of modern art in India. On Gandhi's behest, uh, so let me just read maybe, so that I don't, I don't get the words all wrong. The famous Haripura posters that Nandolal was produced at Gandhi's behest for the 1938 Indian National Congress Convention at Haripura in the state of Gujarat. The 84 posters, which are tempera on handmade paper, this is my writing in that art chapter of the Rutledge book on religion and ecology, on handmade paper, paintings, depict rural life and labor. Cobbler, hunter, musician, nursing mother, tailor, and the flora and fauna of the region bird, camel, lion, fox, flower. Executed in a breezy style with vibrant earth colors, the Haripura posters are considered by some scholars among Bosch's most original work. The manner in which such humble works as cooking and tailor, tailor is on the very left top, are de depicted bringing to bring to mind religious practice of karma yoga or the discipline of action. In such work as Sarangiwala, and Camel both gave equal importance in his framing to human and the non-human animal, which is consistent with his search for unity among the diversity of creation, a practice he equated to spiritual sadhana or discipline. But what is not, uh, K.G. Subramaniam, the late great artist and also an art critic and writer, pointed out the gandhi tagore Bose connection. But he didn't go as far as to suggest that the Horipura posters are the bridge between Gandhi and Tagore. 
because in these 84 posters, which now is accessible through this Google art thing, art and culture thing, you can actually, as you go through it, you see both visions come together beautifully. On top, I just put a couple of them about rural economy and liberation through economy, and the bottom is liberation through cultural regeneration. But he also built a bridge between uh, human and the non-human. And I'll just take a moment, just digress and take a moment, fast forward a little bit beyond the Haripura posters, just to show you the moment of despair in India. Both also started to mix the mythological. Okay, in the stunning painting on Napurna, 1943, moving ahead, he fused religion and the everyday struggle with a biting critique of injustice and war. War is not a part of environmental literary studies, broadly speaking. Rob Nixon did that. But artists have been doing this. Literary scholars have been doing this. So in Bose did that. Nandalal Bose did that. Critique of injustice and war. Goddess Annapurna, wife of Siva, is the provider of food and nourishment. She's seated on a lotus flower with a bowl, with a bowl of rice on one palm and handful of rice on the other. In front of her, Siva, reduced to a skeleton, performs the dance of destruction with an empty begging bowl made from skull. The hoarding of rice from Eastern India by the British for the Allied forces in World War II led to the Great Bengal Famine in 1943. Three million people starved to death. An episode that even many Indians today are not aware of. Both combined several contrasting techniques and themes in the painting. The graphic detail with distinct lines on the figures are placed against an atmospheric background achieved through the wash technique of earlier years. And the poise pose of Annapurna against a cool blue background is juxtaposed with the enraged pose of Shiva against an ochre background of flame, alluding to the tragedy of hunger, starvation, and death in a land of abundance due to war. Annapurna is an exemplary work of political ecology. So all of my work is situated between these two spaces of political ecology and moral ecology. Moving quickly on to the third episode, which also very surprisingly is not that known. So I'm going to read, uh, I'll, I'll show this a little bit later what this is, but I'm going to read from one short essay I wrote last year, a segment on multi-species justice for social text online. Multi, so I, I'm calling it birth of multi-species justice. So what is that? Multi-species justice is not theory or analysis. It is praxis. I do not take claim for coining that term. I think in the contemporary time that uh, credit belongs to, and Joni, correct me if I'm wrong, that belongs to another dear friend, literary studies scholar Ursula Heiss, and I think she did that in 2016. But many other scholars are using this term, including uh, Donna Haraway and others, but my intervention is slightly different because I'm bringing activism into that space and what multi-species justice is for me. So it is praxis. It brings concerns and conservation of biotic life and habitats into alignment with environmental justice and indigenous rights. A little known story. The, these social movements are often at odds with one another. This is because environmental conservation has had a long colonial history with crimes committed against indigenous peoples, as I had mentioned earlier, peoples of color and, pe and poor peoples around the world. A little known story from Alaska's Arctic, though, changes our understanding of that adversarial relationship and, revi and revises the history of environmental justice. The campaign to stop Project Chariot was not only the first major environmental justice campaign, as historian Dan O'Neill has pointed out in his remarkable book, Firecracker Boys, but also the first major multi-species justice campaign. In the 1950s, physicist Edward Teller and his team developed the hydrogen bomb in New Mexico. Armed with the new technology, Teller went to Alaska in 1958 to promote Project Chariot. The plan was to create a deep water harbor by detonating several thermonuclear bombs about 30 miles southeast 
of the Inupiat village of Point Hope along the Chukchi Sea coast in northwest Alaska. If the project had been executed as planned, the combined radiation from the blast would have been equivalent to about 160 times the radiation from the Hiroshima blast. And the US government would have inflicted a crime of epic proportion on the indigenous peoples and animals of the Arctic. The Inupiat people of Point Hope organized about 300 people, organized a movement to stop project, the project. With assistance from three scientists, two of whom were fired by the University of Alaska Fairbanks, and a handful of environmentalists, the people of Point Hope defeated the most powerful federal government agency of its time, the US Atomic Energy Commission. In August 1962, Project Chariot was shelved. But the interesting thing is that this history is not that known even in the environmental justice community. Take, for example, the recently published, it was published last year, the nearly 700-page tome, the Rutledge Handbook of Environmental Justice. There is no mention of Project Chariot. 1962, does anybody know what the significance of that year is? Johnny does, nodding head. Uh, Rachel Carson, Silent Spring. And for the right reasons, credited with uh, sparking or providing the greatest spark for starting the modern environmental movement. But no one knows about the campaign to stop Project Chariot. But that was a starting point, not a stopping point, however. So the man at the center of this image is Howard Rock, whose work you may or may not know about, is an Inupiaq artist, was born and brought up there, and uh, who led the campaign to stop chariot with various creative organizing. Fast forward, that year, 1962, after chariot was shelved, he founded a newspaper called Tundra Times, which was the uh, first statewide newspaper to advocate for indigenous rights and land claims. The newspaper was in operation from 1962 to 1997. To me, Tundra Times is far more important than Life or Look magazine because of, how, because of Howard's leadership, how they were able to bring in art, photography, into conversation with indigenous rights and social justice and environmental rights. Extraordinary work. So these are the three quick examples of how artists have acted as bridge builders. So this was a case of bridge building, because you could not defeat chariot by being alone. All of that then gave me sort of the, uh, the material to think through at least two humble interventions in environmental scholarship and environmental humanities theory. One is Long Environmentalism in a book that Johnny Adamson and Salma Monani edited. And the essential idea in there was people unlikely allies. Well, before that, because we are living at a time when we think about tweets. Like, it's very hard to think beyond a few seconds of reading a tweet. Even these articles I get, even United Nations, reading time four minutes. So it's very hard to think beyond four or five or six or seven minutes. So long environmentalism is not an environmental engagement that lasts minutes or days or hours or months or years, but decades, and in so doing, become intergenerational. But the key in that is unlikely allies, meaning people who, who may be actually adversaries or people who come from different backgrounds, race, class, gender, what have you. Uh, uh, so with that, the other one I mentioned, multi-species justice, which I already spoke about, the genesis of that. But here is what it looks like today. So this is from 2017. My friends organizing in Fairbanks, Alaska, a rally against the Bureau of Land Management's unjust plan to open up the Arctic Refuge coastal plain to oil and gas leasing. I won't go into the image, but just few things to note. It is intersectional. So you can see white people, uh, indigenous people, black people participating. It is intergenerational. You see young people, including a toddler, 
and uh, mother. Okay, it is intermovements. You see protection of land and life into conversation with the climate justice movement, and you even see peace movement. So it is intermovements as well. So I don't have to speak too much. The, the image speaks for itself what multi-species justice looks like on the ground. I'll skip some of these so that I can get to the, uh, quickly to the next part, which is uh, Alaska's Arctic. There are some really interesting stories there, but I'll, I'll uh, not go into that. Uh, Alaska's Arctic. Uh, as Robert mentioned, I work on uh, the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge but all of Alaska's Arctic, it sees, is so biologically diverse that it is not too far from even tropical rainforest, believe it or not. Extraordinary biological diversity. Just in that coastal area, more than 50 million seabirds, 20,000 bowhead whales. There are eight species of whales hanging around there, some giving birth. And on and on and on, hundreds of thousands of caribou, some of them in the Arctic refuge, the porcupine herd, the longest land migration of any animal on the planet, millions of birds on shore as well. So it is just a really a gigantic nursery feeding grounds. And unsurprisingly, because of that, this place and its life has sustained indigenous communities, not only for nutritional purposes, but cultural, spiritual. But since taking office, the Trump administration has launched an all-out war on all of that. Nothing is spared. And uh, with the mandate to make America energy dominant, former Secretary Ryan Zink went to Alaska and said, the only path for energy dominance is a path through the great state of Alaska. What he meant is Alaska's Arctic. So to draw attention to that and create both a scholarly uh, engagement and a conversation nationally, uh, that thing just keeps uh, moving, I organized a conference shortly thereafter in 2018, February, called The Last Oil, a Multi-Species Justice Symposium on Arctic Alaska and Beyond. And our goal was to bring not only the reckless and misguided energy policy of the Trump administration in the Arctic, but also what is happening in my home state of New Mexico and the greater West. Uh, more than 30 speakers across the country and Canada came. Large number of them are indigenous artists, writers, activists, and scholars. So I want to just switch gear and spend maybe a couple of minutes about pedagogy. So at that time, I was teaching a class called Integrative Ecology and Social Transformation, which is a very highly interdisciplinary class. Usually students from 10 to 15 different departments take it. It's a seminar course. Graduate students and senior undergrad students take it. So I had casually asked them, go ahead and write a response paper as your midterm. And I, I was so busy, I didn't give any guidance, nothing, and no expectation either. It was a very casual remark. What came back was extraordinary, particularly the contributions from undergraduate students. Extraordinary. But at the same time, I would say, some are extraordinary, some are middle ground, and few drop off the map, which is everywhere. Uh, but that said, so I decided to do and my research associate, Laura Carlson, who received a MFA from uh, University of Pennsylvania, said, let's get to work, and I'll learn how to do book publishing. I have no idea about how to design a book or anything like that. Laura went to work on Indigenous People Says Day 2018. We published a 220-page publication, The Last Toil Students Respond. It's all about the students. Extraordinary original work of art got created. This is by Indigenous Diné artist Jerome Lewis, who was my student also. But in that, uh, let me just take a moment to read this section, if I may. It is not often that we see indigenous activists, singers, conservation biologists, environmental law experts, museum curators, science professors, and college undergraduates sharing the same space to collectively raise awareness and call for action on numerous interconnected issues. Lima is a student from Spain, extraordinary piece. This is the opening piece. On the left is another extraordinary under, undergraduate student. She is from San Ildefonso Pueblo, 
Jennifer Marley, who was featured in the New York Times not that long ago, except New York Times did not even mention her name. Uh, she's one of our most inspiring indigenous activists working today in uh, New Mexico. So with that, but it's not only interdisciplinary, as Lima wrote, and intersectional, but also inter intergenerational. So on the left top is Sarah James, one of the most important and significant indigenous activists, who is also my mentor and teacher. She has worked nearly 40 years now to defend the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge and the Guichin culture, won the Goldman Prize. And on the right, an Arctic refuge to Sarah's people, the Guichin people, they call it Itsiguatsan Gwandai Godlit, which means the sacred place where life begins. On the right is Cheyenne Antonio, who graduated from UNM with an undergraduate and was the president of the Indigenous Student Club. Kiva Club has been fighting one of the most important indigenous activists working in New Mexico today to fight to stop the expansion of oil and gas drilling in the land that they consider sacred, the greater Chaco Canyon landscape. So this is intergenerational as well. And these are my two teachers, along with Sarah James. On the top is Robert Thompson. And on the right is Rosemary Atwan Garwak. The last 12 students respond is a humble publication. I write in my short little introduction, three pages, that's it. Rest is all student, student contributions. The last 12 students respond is a humble publication with which we signal the need for and the significance of interdisciplinary and intersectional pedagogy and practice for our time. And our time is a precarious time, as Robert beautifully articulated in his expansive introductory remarks. That work continues on. We just did this uh, letter campaign, which many of you in this room signed. Thank you. And I did, we did something quite extraordinary. Uh, it's not historic first. We, we found out that Fairbanks had done something similar, but maybe historic second. But nevertheless, nationally, historically significant. When the government refuses, refuses to hold public hearing on environmental impact statement, I'm finishing the statement, communities take over. And we took over. We organized this community hearing in which indigenous peoples and environmental organizations nationally came. And so with that, do I have any more minutes? Fine. That's good. Yeah, yeah. So I'll skip all this. This is just a one quick note to the second, second case study in, the, in this essay was the Arctic Ocean. And this is an extraordinary news we just had, that the Trump's order to open Arctic waters to oil drilling was unlawful, federal judge finds. Five, in five minutes, I'll wrap this up. This is my current work and moving forward, connecting the dots. Connecting the dots is not about social action. It's an analytical, intellectual activity where you're combining. The phrase comes from climate change communication, where you're connecting dots of various environmental uh, extreme weather events across geographies. But we need to do more than that. We need to also connect it and take it to the realm of life uh, across species, across places, across peoples, across time, across various drivers. Trouble in New Mexico between 2001 and 2006, 90% of New Mexico state tree, the pinion, which has great cultural significance and ecological significance, died uh, due to drought and uh, warming, extreme warming. At the time, so I did a five-year project on that walking around my own home, uh, which was shown at the Eman Carter Museum of American Art as the exhibit where I live, I hope to know. But in that work, my interest was not what has already been lost, but what is unseen. Right there in that work of art, that, or one of them, the word unseen is mentioned, or one of the works on this wall, so it's about the unseen, because I began to speculate. I wrote about it as well as the work like this. is about, we know what has been lost, but what have we lost that we do not know and will never know? Meaning, 50 million trees are gone. All these animals depend on those trees. What happened to them? How many hundreds of millions or billions are out there that we have lost that we have no idea? So I wrote about it in an academic art essay, but we found out what actually happened, at least part of it, last year. 
So Los Alamos uh, ornithologist, Jean Fair, and her team quietly did a study, and they found that the study was published last year. Between 2003 and 2013, in the Pajarito Plateau, ironically named, because Pajarito means little bird, in the Pajarito Plateau, the diversity of birds following the pinion die off, we lost diversity by 45%, and we lost numbers, populations, by 76%. Extraordinary. So one of my students, another extraordinary undergraduate student of anthropology, the loss of a namesake. She spoke with Fair, Dr. Fair, and her study, and she turned the study into story. This is where humanities come in. This is what we do. We bring in a moral lens. We bring in an ethical lens. We bring in a political lens. We bring in a social lens. So this student did an extraordinary work. And now with her, another indigenous student of mine, Dylan McLaughlin, a graduate student, Maxwell Museum of Anthropology is going to do a major exhibition where we are going to bring in archaeologists, anthropologists, and look at very deeply what Pinion means for New Mexico and its loss and everything else with it. So it's connecting the dots across species, in this case, across species and time, but also across disciplines. Fast forward in two minutes. Last year, the Living Planet Report, published by World Wildlife Fund and the Zoological Society of London. The news is very, very grim. Some of you have seen it in popular press and media. Numbers are astounding. It's hard to comprehend. That is, Central and Latin America, monitored populations of vertebrates have been lost about 90% since 1970. Freshwater populations across the world, 83%. In India and the South Pacific and Southeast Asia, 64%. Nobody knows what actually this means. So. With that, I began to think about theoretical frames above and beyond what journalism is doing. So I gave a talk at Pratt Institute where I was just beginning. This is just an early work where I was, I'm thinking of frames. So let us shift the narrative focus of the ongoing mass species extinction crisis from extinction to die off and massacre, also massacre. Rather than waiting for an uncertain future time, the shift will encourage us to engage with the present Rather than mourning that which is no more, the shift will encourage us to fight for the survival of the living. The focus on die-off and massacres will also bring the crisis closer to home, a special shift. And it will help expose more effectively the media drivers of the extinction crisis. Then I wrote a popular piece in Tom Dispatch of the Nation Institute, which was also published in The Nation, where basically the end is essentially the biological annihilation what some of us think is a more expansive crisis than climate breakdown and a more challenging one to mitigate than climate breakdown. The simple reason is all aspects of modern life, its institutions, and the aspirations of nation states are directly linked to biological annihilation, past, present, and will be future. So it's a much more expensive crisis and a much harder to address and deal with. Unfortunately, it has no visibility like the climate. So with that in mind, we are doing two things. Uh, we are looking at a first a region wide. So this exhibition species in peril along the Rio Grande will open. In addition to, so I'm co-curating this with a dear colleague, Dr. Josie Lopez, who is an art historian and the curator of art at the Albuquerque Museum in my home city. The work will be presented in 516 Arts. More importantly, neither Josie and I are interested in just the art for the art's sake. What we are interested in is, is building a community, building bridges. So we are going to do, be doing extensive public programming. Artists are coming all the way from Colorado, New Mexico, West Texas, and Northern Mexico. And we have partner organizations in all four places where extensive programming will take place. Because the aim is to build a model of how to even enter to begin to apprehend what Rob Nixon called, begin to apprehend this crisis at a regional level. So it's a regional model. Last remark is that my home state, this is a tragedy, whenever you look at national ranking, goes something like this. What is known, including by my university of our administration, we rank the worst in the country in child welfare. 
We rank worst in the country, 50 out of 50, in opioid crisis. We are one of the poorest states in the country, the sixth poorest. It used to be second poorest. On and on. It's a long list. It's a litany of social tragedies. But there is another way to think about New Mexico. New Mexico harbors half of the bird species of the United States. Out of 1,100 plus species, New Mexico harbors 544. Only Joni's home state beats us by a tiny bit, Arizona, and then above that is California. New Mexico is ranked number three in bird diversity, number three in native mammals, and overall biodiversity number four. Cultural diversity is very high. Linguistic diversity is number two. There are other ways to think about how we think of vitality of space. It's not just economics or it's not just social tragedies. There are other ecological and cultural vitality and richness as well. With all of that, I've just launched, hopefully, at least a decade-long project. I'm taking a year off. I'm very thankful to my dean and the chair for giving me, because I don't even qualify. I just joined two years ago, qualify for a sabbatical. But have, uh, my dean and the chair has given me a one-year research leave to begin look at. It's a global project. Within the next uh, 15 months, I, my hope is to travel at least a dozen countries. Largely will be India and Central and Latin America. Lots of colleagues are coming forward to help. And I hope I'll be able to partner in some ways with this institution because it is a moral issue as much as it is a scientific issue. Thank you. We have time for some questions. Uh, our head librarian, Brooke Andrade, has a microphone. So if you will raise your hand, she will bring you the microphone. And I'm trying to spot any. And you can ask me about anything, precarity, about art, about humanities, any number of things. Uh, And this is, by the way, not a real site. It's, it's an aspiration. <laughs> Hopefully it will happen before too long. Well, first of all, thank you very, very much for that marvelous uh, presentation. Uh, I couldn't help but thinking, being from India, seems to me one of the issues that is driving our ecological crisis has been the objectification of natural resources it has been the disconnect between the, the, the heart, we as human beings, and our connection to the natural world, and that objectification of turning natural resources into a commodity. But in ancient India, in the great epics of India, they talk about the Sangita of the Ved, which is the realization and the recognition that all knowledge involves a relationship of three things. Rishi, the knower, subjective, devata, process of knowing, and chandas, that which is known. And if those three components to all knowledge are experienced in their diversified state, that disconnects us to the object of awareness. And that knowledge to be complete must integrate the subject with the object and the relationship between them. Can you comment on how you feel that might impact your work with regard to connecting up the human heart through art and its relationship to the natural world, which is really embedded in one of the oldest systems of knowledge on the planet from your great country? Thank you so much for bringing that up. And along with India, I would also like to add which you so beautifully articulated from memory, uh, I would also add that indigenous knowledge and practices all over the world have uh, not only just thought about, but practiced this connection with the natural world that is now being fractured all over. So it is the, the real work that lie ahead. So bringing back Gandhi, Gandhi had recognized what was going on. 
Tagore had recognized what was going on at the time. Fast forward, the sad thing is that, and Ram Guha in his book, uh, India After Gandhi, pointed out that those ideals India did not follow. We are somewhere else. And I feel that even Tagore's ideals are nowhere today in Indian academia. So that said, it is our work. Now that we know that we are living through this increasingly precarious time, artists and scholars in humanities uh, and social scientists have an incredible uh, work to do to reestablish these connections. Because without the heart, it's impossible to actually fight this systemic violence that are being. So, I mean, it may sound romantic, but it is true that uh, you go for a hike, it does something to you. You go for a backpack, you look at those flowers, you look at the birds, you look at them, and you listen to them away from our sort of the uh, steel and concrete structures. It does something to us in a deep way. So it is the work of the artist. So this is why the moral and ethical frame is the most important one, and this is why history matters. Looking back, what did people do and what did they think? Not to, not to romanticize, but I even, even push back against that word that, yes, like nobody wants to go back. We are all progressing forward, but that is not true. If like Johnny's book, like integrating, uh, uh, tell me the uh, subtitle of the book, integrating knowledge and, no, not the cosmos, the other, other volume, the Rutledge volume, he did with the Australian scholar. Environmental uh, humanities. Humanities for the environment integrating knowledge and practices, right? So that's what uh, scholars in arts and humanities can offer, and it's incredibly, it's invaluable. So bringing old traditions, like in, in case of India, but also indigenous traditions, because there is a lot we can learn. So it's not about romantic that we are going back, because if you think about indigenous activism today, it is about going back, even as we move forward. First of all, thank you for your presentation. I had the privilege of being in the same show as you, Vanishing Ice, <laughs> which traveled to four museums over two years. And um, I worked with docents at the Whatcom and then at, um, down in El Paso, and then again in Canada over two years. The last one was in the McMichael Museum. Great museum. And what was so interesting was the change and the rapidity of change on the planet during those two years and the atmosphere working with docents. Uh, starting off at the Whatcom, the docents were very, very afraid of dealing with the public. Then after that, there was the landslide in the Cascades. Going down to New Me to uh, Te West Texas, it was so interesting that they hadn't had rain or snow for five years, and they were totally receptive to the show. And then your photograph of the caribou. I've worked in, I'm a painter, and I've worked in the Arctic and the Antarctic. And then finally in Canada, because they have um, uh, a polar coastline. Uh, the, the total change in the reception, uh, not only by the docents, but by the public, of their loss of land. The uh, First Nation peoples were at the uh, opening, and you know, in two years, things had changed rapidly. Um, I, I've worked a lot with children, and what I found, I have a website, and I have found, unbeknownst to any kind of... Uh, uh, stimulation on my part with schools, that schools are going to the website now and are working from my paintings. I've actually done a six-month project with children locally here in Chapel Hill. And um, working with children, I think, is really the way to go in many, many ways in building an alliance with the next generation and making them stakeholders in um, their future. I'd like you to comment on... Uh, active work with children because I'm finding that's the direction I'm going in now. I also work with refugees from Burma who have been thrown out of the Karen lands and they are also here in Chapel Hill. So I'd like to think about children as another uh, part of our future work and how do you think we can incorporate working with the younger generation in this? <laughs> 
Thank you so much for your extraordinarily important remarks. Uh, so let me see if I can bring that slide back. So right there is. In so thank you for that remark, and it's and and for your work and everything that you are doing, working with children as allies and uh, and partners is extraordinarily important. They are the ones who are leading charge right now, as Greta Thunberg uh, has been. Every Friday she goes <laughs> and protests in Sweden at the sta their state capital, uh, and the student walkout that just happened two weeks ago was, what was the number, like uh, 140 countries, and I'm trying to remember the millions, extraordinary. So they're picking up. So, And the issue is that when we grew up, we really didn't know this stuff. Now we are beginning to find out, or another generation. They're growing up in this. They're, they're aware of this. So they're engaging with this in a much more urgent and more exciting way than maybe what we have done. So working with children, whether activists or artists or anything that they're doing to engage the community, their community, is extraordinary. Let me just add to that. I believe today is Jane Goodall's birthday. Is that oh, correct? Yes. And her Roots and Shoots program, of course, begins with the elementary school. Um, and I would also like to acknowledge the um, the country of Costa Rica, uh, which has ecological literacy built in and integrated through the entire curriculum, beginning with first grade. So your work is extremely important, and we see other examples. Thank you for the wonderful presentation and illustrated um, uh, points. Um, please forgive my ignorance, but I wonder if you might clarify your last point. Uh, I believe um, there's a lot of information communicated, but I, I think you were s somehow juxtaposing and, and I'm sure making a point regarding the assessment, let's say, of, of what you call your home state, New Mexico, as you know, trailing behind in child welfare, et cetera, but that it actually fits in very different rankings with regard to biodiversity, shall we say. Help me understand the connection between the two. Thank you for that uh, question. So, because I showed that in New Mexico, you know, legislatures or even my university administrators, rightly so, not to take away, those crises are very real. Social crisis in New Mexico is very real. Opioid crisis in New Mexico is very real. Child welfare crisis is very real, and on and on. So it's not the connection. So what I was trying to bring attention to is that these social crises are beginning to get attention, and they should, they must. But the ecological vitality of New Mexico does not. So it's always mentioned as the poorest state that nobody wants to live there, which is fine. But the ecological vitality of New Mexico does not show up in anybody's. Even when I was pulling together that list, even my own colleagues who are in the field of science were like, really? So it's quite surprising that this is where we live, and yet we don't talk about that. And the reason that is important for us is not just the work that we are beginning to initiate now, but also something like, let's say, the, one of the great, great crises of, at least the national crisis, with the US-Mexico wall that President Trump wants to expand and build. So through that little thing, because one of my colleagues is a historian, a very eminent uh, borderlands historian, Samuel Truitt, and the biologist friend, really well-known uh, mammalogist, Joseph Cook, we did a small op-ed for Albuquerque Journal just to bring attention to the fact that if you just look at those four states, border states, and look at the biological diversity, it's extraordinary, but it doesn't get talked about. Along with the cultural crisis that the indigenous people and non-indigenous people on both sides of the border is already facing and would exacerbate. So the, so the idea was it, it was not to create any kind of a um, alternate parallel that this is important than the other or anything like that, or create a relation either, is just to highlight 
that we, as we struggle to address ecological crises, uh, social crises, we must not uh, forget about the ecological crisis as well. So that was the idea. Similar to biological annihilation, there are many other crises that we ought to attend to, uh, including, let's say, the crisis of the Palestinian people, the greatest human rights crisis to, on the planet facing. Uh, that need to be attended to. But also the biological crisis is very real. So that was the thing. It's not to create a false dichotomy or anything like that. Does that clarify what you're asking? Or, or I'm not sure exactly what the question was, other than that there are two different things. Sentence meaning because one gets the attention, the other does not. So it's a complete silence of the other. They're completely two different things. It's like, I'll give you an example. So we can talk about environmental issues all day long and never mention indigenous. So it's that kind of thing. It's the silence is what I'm highlighting here. Not that they're related or they are, it's the silence. So not allowing the silence to continue. That's what that was about. Shabankar, I want to thank you so much for your talk. Thank you for speaking to us from your heart. Um, I was really interested in your last slide where you, you were talking about your new project, Bio, Biological Annihilation. And you, have, you had three sort of tiles. One said memories plus studies into stories. The next one was stories to analysis and then analysis plus stories into action. And I know that you're just beginning this project, and so you know it's new. But I was wondering if you could sort of talk a little bit about um, how you're thinking about memory study into story, and story to analysis, and um, stories into action. Because if if what's beyond despair is action, then this seems like a really important thing for us to talk about: the role of stories. Thank you, Joni. And who better to ask that question? <laughs> Thank you for uh, highlighting the idea of stories. So what is happening right now? By the way, as I said, I sh probably shouldn't be showing this slide because this isn't even thought through. It's Laura and I just quickly slapping together <laughs> a couple of quick ideas to put something up. But nevertheless, um, so to just to back up, so there is no scarcity of scientific report on biological crisis. Because what happened, and the interesting thing, some of you know this history, is the United Nations two separate organizations were founded exactly at the same time in 1992 in Earth Summit in Rio. One was the UNFCCC, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, that's been looking at the climate crisis, and the other is Center for uh, Convention on Biological Diversity that's been looking at the biodiversity issue. One has made a lot more progress than the other. One is a lot more visible than the other. Nevertheless, not to undermine the work of CBD, it hasn't progressed very far. The second thing is that, and part of it is CBD's lack of engagement with the public and whatnot. That aside, a deeper analysis is necessary there. But that aside, and now in the last six years, UN, is, UN has created a parallel structure like the UNFCCC. You have the IPCC, the name that you're familiar with, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Now they have created something called IPBES, Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiver Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services or something like that. So they'll be looking at this. And the 2020 is a crucial year for IPBS. All that said, there is no scarcity of scientific report on the status of biological crisis. Hundreds and hundreds of reports. It's not just the Living Planet report I showed. There is State of the World Bird report. There is the Arctic Biodiversity report. On and on and on and on and on. And somehow, and there is incredible wealth of information. But it's just sitting there. So it is for us now, scholars in humanities, to come in and say, dig that up. So that is sort of the studies part. Memories is a really a very interesting situation. 
because one of the great crises that you may have read in the New York Times and in the Guardian, Guardian was the first to highlight, is the crisis of the insect die-off, that uh, insects are dying off at an extraordinary rate, and if the insect go, the whole ecosystem goes. Some of that story is coming from memories, not just in North America, where people remember driving back in the 70s and the whole windshield would be splattered with insect uh, thing, and then you have to clean it up, and you hate it, and talk about it. That apparently does not happen. In the UK, people are talking about their uh, glass windows where the moths would be attracted to light. Doesn't happen. So there are all these memories that are just as valid as the scientific studies and stories, just like indigenous traditional ecological knowledge is just as valid and important as the scientific knowledge. Similarly, so memories is very important because I work with and you work with indigenous uh, elders and they remember, like in the Arctic, uh, Reverend uh, Trimble Gilbert remembers all these birds that used to churn in the river and do this and that and hear them does not happen. That is just as valid as a scientific study. So that's the memories part. But turning into stories, and the stories I mentioned because my student, she did an extraordinary work with a very simple amount of material and data to turn a rather tragic a story unfolding in New Mexico into a beautiful story because what she did, she's, she does linguistic anthropology or that's what she's aspiring to study. So she was playing with language and it was very, very rich. What an undergraduate student can take a scientific study and turn something like that and with visuals called story map. So that's really important. So, and then these two are just something I cooked up, but back to the stories. Because without these stories, there is plenty of data out there. Just like there is plenty of climate data, there is plenty of data. It's time now, humanity scholars. Just like we say, humanity scholars have to get engaged with climate crisis, they have now. Now it's time for humanity scholars to engage with the biological crisis in a very expansive, sincere way. Uh, and I look forward to working with many of you collectively and collaboratively on that. Um, just a brief question. I I really liked the, the last segment where you talked about different generations and unlikely allies coming together. And um, several of the examples that you had were of people coming together to resist something that would hurt a species or indigenous people or the planet. Um, how do we move to an action that's not just resisting but creating and doing that? with different generations and different kinds of people. Because it seems like once you've resisted something and you have these allies, then sometimes it's harder to move on and decide what the positive, you know, forward motion might be. That is not just a short, quick remark, but one of the most important <laughs> questions, uh, which I, and, and you very correctly observed that. So, personally, my work resides in the domain of resistance, Arctic work, resides in the domain of resistance. But when I'm talking about, let's say, biodiversity in New Mexico or the borderland, I'm actually highlighting the celebration. That said, in 2017, soon after coming to New Mexico, I organized a conference called Decolonizing Nature, uh, Resistance, Resilience, and Revitalization. And the opening keynote was our very dear friend, Dr. Robert Newman and Joni Adamson, they spoke at that conference. So, uh, so yes, absolutely, absolutely. Like, because these are stories, especially indigenous resilience. I mean, I don't want to speak on anybody's behalf, nor do I want to mischaracterize, but there are stories that in moments of precarity, how do people survive? What do they do? How does why song and dance and music and food matter? Like one question I get asked, even though it's a resistance movement, long environmentalism, repeatedly people ask me, how does something like that survive for 70 years? What is it that makes it go so long and people don't tire or whatnot? And I said, it's very simple facts. It's nothing to do with politics, none whatsoever. It's about music, food, dancing, and stories. And it really is. Because if it is politics, you can't keep this thing sustaining over seven decades. 
it sustains because of stories, because of music, because of dance. And it's true. It's not any romanticization. So what you brought up, and there are all these examples of beautiful ecological resilience stories from all over the world and revitalizing, revitalization stories that are happening even as communities are struggling to survive. So it's, again, it's one of those, not to create a dichotomy or any kind of a, a triple thing, but all of that matters, if that makes sense. Sorry. <laughs> I can't think of a better note on which to close. That is Shabankar's note, not that one. Um, and uh, as a segue into the next two days, uh, we have a reception. We can continue more informal conversation over the reception. It's back here. And please join me in thanking Shabankar for an incredible talk. Thank you.